We interviewed over 100 songwriters, and here are things that across the board people were saying. You got one for us, Clay? Yes. I'm surprised at how many songwriters we talked to. One of the biggest things they said is you've got to write a lot of songs to get to the good ones. You know, and I'd always heard that when I first started wanting to be a professional songwriter. I went and played someone, some of my songs, and they were like, yeah, come back when you write a couple hundred more. <laughs> I was like, what? Yeah. <laughs> you know, and um, so I've always been fascinated, but not just on the level, because I think you can, if you're a talented writer, write one of your first songs and it'd be really good. Mm -hmm. I mean, that can happen. I think where that helps when you write a lot of songs is it helps keep you consistent. And I think more than just writing a big number, because we have a lot of people in Songtown and they're, you know, they're like, well, we wrote all these songs, wrote 300 songs this year. That's awesome. You know, that that's cool. But I think more important than that is the fact that you're writing all the time. So Ed Sheeran said that when he's writing a song, sometimes when you first get going, it's like you turn on a dirty faucet and there's all this brown water coming mm -hmm. out. But you let it run for a little while, you write for a little while, and then you get to the good stuff. You know, so I think that's important to keep in mind is that you want to keep that flow going. You want to keep that channel open. And sometimes writing a lot of songs is a way to keep that open uh -huh. so you don't go back to the dirty water. My first publisher was a Hall of Fame songwriter, had tons of Garth cuts and all this stuff. And I, I found a song in his catalog that was kind of a stinker one day, and I was teasing him about it. And he said, son, you got to write out all your bad ones to get to the good ones. And, you know, he would say that to me every now and then. He's like, yeah, that one's not great, but that's all right. You know, you're getting, you're getting yourself to your good ones by getting some of the bad ones out, you know. Yeah, and also, when you write 100 songs, all of a sudden you're tired. You know, you've written all the stuff you can think of to write, and you're, so you've got a choice to make. I'm going to learn to dig deeper and come up with better stuff, or I'm just going to keep writing the same crap over and over and over. Yeah. So it kind of forces you to, okay, I've got to get better. I've got to come up with better ideas. And it makes you dig a little deeper, you know, so that you're not just, otherwise you'll get so bored with just writing the same thing all the time, mm. you know? Also, my first publisher, somebody called him one day and said, um, hey, I've got a song that'd be perfect for Garth Brooks. If you'll get it to him, <laughs> I'll give you my publishing if he cuts it. And Kim said, well, how many songs have you written? And this guy goes, one. <laughs> and Kim said, well, write 100 songs and send me the best one. Yeah. And he never heard from him again, you know, because that's, yeah. that's not the answer we want to hear a lot of times. But it takes writing a lot of songs to get to the good ones. Yeah. And when you've only written a few songs, every song gets you excited. Mm -hmm. If you've written 100 songs, then you look back, oh, I can get excited about those too. Yeah. You know, and then that raises your bar. So the next hundred songs, you know, you're trying mm -hmm. to, to write as well as those two. And you right. look back and maybe you've got four in the next batch. But yeah. it's a process. Absolutely. Um, the second one would be study what's worked, past and present. It's really important to know what's going on right now. But it's also important to know what has gone on in the past. Yeah. Um, I wrote with a young songwriter recently in Nashville and um, he made the comment, yeah, I don't I don't know a lot of the older country artists. And I said, like, who would you consider older? And he said, oh, like Billy Currington. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, he's listing current stars, Yeah, you know? And I'm like, well, you know, you might want to go back and do a little studying on the history of country music if you're going to mm -hmm. write it, you know, and listen to some Merle Haggard and some George Jones, people back there. And one of the reasons that's important when Jason Matthews and I wrote Must Be Doing Something Right our idea was let's write something that kind of has a little bit of a throwback country R and B feel. And we were talking about, you know, Conway Twitty used to do some of that and different people, mm -hmm. but it wasn't happening right then, you know? So because we knew what it worked in the past, we could kind of bring that um, groove into a, a modern song, make it feel modern, but also kind of have this throwback um, thing. And that became one of my biggest songs. And I think it's because it has some of those elements of a classic, but it also has, elements that make it feel really modern. So the more you know and the broader your um, understanding of what's worked in the genre that you're writing, I think you're going to get to a lot of, of more unique and creative songs. 
Yeah, I mean, even right now, it's hard to be even a pop writer if you don't have an understanding of 80s music because mm -hmm. there's so much 80s influencing pop and country. Yeah. Country's being influenced by 80s and 90s. So if you don't go back a little bit and listen, if you're only listening to current artists, it's going to be a pretty shallow toolbox that you develop as a writer. You're only going right. to be able to pull from a shallow pool. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. You got one for us? Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see here. Don't rest on your past. I think the big thing here is that every pro successful songwriter that I know that you know works hard to get better at their craft. Even if they've had, like you, a wall of, you've got a wall of gold records behind you. Um, it That doesn't mean anything. You show up every day and every day is a new day to prove yourself all over again and to come up with a better song than you wrote the day before. Uh, at one of my number one parties, my publisher came up, or the head of our publishing company, who was in Canada most of the time, so he wasn't, like, seeing me every day. And he came up and said, congratulations, what you got next? <laughs> and at first, it kind of irritated me. But when I started thinking about it, I was realized I wrote that song a year ago. If, if, yeah. I've, if I've not been doing anything else since then, I'm probably not going to be around long in the publishing world. So um, it it kind of challenged me to rethink that of like, yeah, celebrate every little thing that happens, but don't focus on that and kind of rest on your laurels because you have done that great thing. Let that be a celebration and move on because you've got greater things to do down the road. Yeah, and there's that old phrase, uh, keep a lot of irons in the fire, meaning if you have a lot of possible good things out there that might happen, you're not going to be devastated when somebody cuts your song and says, oh, it's going to be on my next project or it's going to be my next single. And then they change their mind and they never put the song out. Right. That would crush you if that's the only thing you have going on. Right. So by staying busy and having a lot of things happening across the board, then makes those defeats a little less painful when they happen. I mean, yeah. it still hurts, but absolutely, I'm, I'm not bitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, so the, the fourth one for me would be pivotal moments can happen out of nowhere. Oh, man. And there was a day I had written with Billy Currington, and he was waiting on a ride. And so we were sitting out on the curb in front of my publishing company. Now, this was before he had yeah, a big hit or anything? Yeah, Billy had no hits at the okay. time. And I had no no real, I had, I had had a top 10 with Rascal Flats, but I had not had a number one or anything. And it had been a while. And so Billy and I were talking, and he said, man, I'm worried I'm going to lose my record deal because I haven't had a hit. And I said, yeah, I haven't had a hit with this company. My other hit was with my previous company, mm -hmm. and I'm afraid I might lose my writing deal. And about two months later, uh, I show up to write with Jason Matthews. Um, we had been working on another song for two days. We discovered neither of us liked it. And so Jason said, let's write something people can make out to. And we wrote Must Be Doing Something Right. We pitched it to Billy. A couple months later, it comes out as a single on him. And it was the first number one for Billy, for Jason, and for me. Yeah. And it kind of saved all of our careers in a way because um, we, we needed that bump. You know, we needed that boost. And so, you know, I just think back of going, well, I could have just quit after that conversation with I Billy. Know. Or I could have, you know, not showed up on that day with Jason and all those things. And um, Kim Williams, my first publisher, used to say, it's, it's all about keeping your butt in the chair, yeah. you know? And he would, he would encourage me, don't focus on what hasn't happened or, or what's happening right now. Focus on where you want to go and keep showing up and doing the work. And, yeah. and you had a cool story about that too, I think, about somebody that almost gave up. Yeah, Reggie Ham said that he was, he's gone on to write many Christian and some country hits and songs and movies, just a great writer. And he was saying that there came a point early on, his grandfather was in the service. So he was literally walking out his front door. He was so frustrated, didn't have anything going on. He was walking out his front door to sign up in the military. I think he was probably like 20 years old or something. And 
he gets a call on the way out saying, hey, somebody canceled. We had three writers on this writing session. One writer canceled. Will you come fill in? And he said it wasn't somebody that he knew all that well. It was like this random call. So he goes and writes, and it ends up being his first cut. It kept, it made him rethink going and joining the military. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in the, to him, if he had done that, it was a wonderful calling. People in his family had done it. But it just shows you that one single moment that he got that phone call. Mm-hmm. What if that call didn't happen? Right. Like, he never would have gone on to write those hits, probably. Yeah. He would have been serving in the military somewhere, on a base, yeah. you know, or in Iraq or wherever. I mean, it's just those kind of stories, and we hear a lot of those um, from our friends that, you know, there's moments where they're literally like, God, if this is supposed to happen, give me a sign because I'm going to quit, you know. Yeah. And then then it happens. You know, I, I can remember myself— um, First time I ever came to Nashville, was lucky enough to get a meeting with Mark Bright at EMI Music. And I didn't really think about, I was living in New York. Here I was flying to Nashville because he wanted to meet with me. And I sat in my car and this feeling came over me. I've never had this happen in my entire life ever after. But this feeling came over me that my life was about to change. And I went into that meeting and he offered me a publishing deal, wanted me to move to Nashville. And it's like, it was so eerie because I didn't, I mean, I'm getting chill bumps thinking about it now. Mm-hmm. I did not, that was not in my plan to move to Nashville to be a songwriter. Mm-hmm. But something told me, this just feeling came over me, your life's about to change. And it was just the weirdest thing. Yeah. You know? So. I, I love those stories about pivotal moments. You know, and on the other side of that um, scenario, too, I had a friend who um, was, he had not had any hits yet. He was kind of struggling, but he had an appointment with a big hit songwriter one day. And um, on the day that he was supposed to go write with that guy, he discovered that his car tags had expired. And so he calls the guy and says, hey, I'm going to have to cancel. I got to go get my tag <laughs> no. renewed. And the guy goes, man, I've, I've got this great chorus started. Please just come. We can finish it real quick, and then you can go get your car done. And he was like, no, I mean, like, what if I get a ticket on the way over there? Long story short, the guy wrote the song by himself, Ugh. and it became a number one song. Well, And my friend lost his writing deal. Well, you're just ending this on a bum note. <laughs> well, I'm just saying— <laughs> We the- could do a whole episode <laughs> on pivotal moments in our careers that cost us big time. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, my point being— don't give up. You yeah. know, if you believe in yourself and you love what you do, take advantage of every opportunity you've got yeah. and show up for those moments. That's know. the key. You said that before. The biggest thing is to show up. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. you could miss a number one song by not being there. Okay. You want to talk about our sponsor, Sweetwater? We love Sweetwater. There's a link in the show notes. There's a link to our books about songwriting and to Songtown. We'd love for you to check it out. We've got a great community of people. Like, follow, subscribe, all those things. Uh, We appreciate you and uh, hope you learn some things when you watch our podcast. Cheers. Cheers.